Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Castillo. Thank you guys for having um, us here. Uh, we'll be talking about Lincoln Financial Group and we have a workshop here for you all on financial literacy as well as we'll be talking a little bit about our company as well. So a wide variety of different topics here. Um, this is more of a discussion. So feel free if you have any questions along the way, you can enter your questions in the chat. Um, and then we'll also have some stopping points uh, for any questions that you wanna turn on your camera or turn on your, um, I guess your voice, I can't think right now. Uh, you can ask your questions there and <laughs> we'll, we'll go from there. We will also monitor the chat for you. So if, if you do feel a little bit more bashful, feel free to ask a question in the chat. Yes, yep. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm actually a PFW alumni. I graduated in 2020 with a bachelor's in organizational leadership. Uh, before I, I was actually a transfer student. So I went to Ivy Tech for my first two years and received my associates in business. Um, during my time at PFW, I was, uh, I was involved in several student orgs, and um, I also did two internships before I graduated. So um, even though I was not in the school business, I, I can relate to a lot of the things that you guys have to do before you graduate. Um, so very, very much so, I just graduated college. And so being a recent college grad into, I guess, the real world, it's definitely been pretty eye-opening for me. Um, Let's see, I started Lincoln June 2020, so right after my graduation. Um, I'm kind of in a unique position in the company, and we'll kind of talk about this later, but I'm in our leadership preparation program. Essentially, it's our college new grad program that's for two years, and basically you do like rotations and special projects. So it's kind of like an internship, um, but it's a longer time period, and then you have to be a college grad. And so I'm actually finishing my uh, rotation um, coming up in June. And so it's a great program to get professional work, um, get your foot in the door with the company and stuff like that. But uh, we'll, we'll talk in more detail the other other programs that we have here at Lincoln. Um, if, you're, if you were raised in Port, the Fort Wayne area, uh, you know that Lincoln's one of the top employers here. Um, either you have a family member, friend, or you've driven downtown and you see the big Lincoln building. And so um, very happy always wanted to work at Lincoln or a big company and, and always kind of wanted to stay in Fort Wayne. And so it was a good mesh of uh, joining a company after I graduate. Some other things that I like about Lincoln, uh, we are currently working from home slash having some sort of hybrid model. Um, myself, I enjoy working from home. I started since I started working from home and haven't been back to the office or actually I've never been to the office. So pretty interesting experience there. Um, I do like that the company values diversity um, at Lincoln. We have uh, business resource groups. Basically, they're kind of like student organizations for the company, and you can join different ones. There's a Latino, uh, we call them BRGs for short. Uh, I myself is, uh, am in that group, Marcella as well. You can join other ones too, uh, from like um, Asian American to um, uh, disabilities to uh, veterans, so a lot of different type of groups um, if you want and your work allows. I really like that. And then obviously the growth piece, and I won't go into too much detail, but there's a lot of opportunity here at Lincoln, regardless of where you're at in your career path. Um, there's a, a place for you, if you will. So it's a little bit about me. And then you probably saw that picture. I have actually three pets. I have a dog and two cats, but I only have two of them in that picture there. I got them all in 2020, so they're uh, my quarantine babies. And if you guys have pets, you know, you know that they they like me being at home all the time. <laughs> I'll pass it over to Marcella. Oh, thank you, Brian. My name is Marcella Martinez. I am a retirement consultant with Lincoln, and my job is hybrid, but I do get to travel quite a bit. Um, especially when I have to do enrollments, I help participants with their like 401ks or 403b, which is ways for them to save for retirement. And I kind of feel like I have the best job because um, I get to interact with people and I get to make an impactful difference uh, with them. Um, 
and it's you know it's something that I've been uh, very happy to do, and I've been doing this uh, with Lincoln since 2016. Um, and that's what I do. I get to travel um, all over the United States, but when I'm not traveling, then I get to work from home like I'm doing today. And then with that, I'll pass it over to Amanda. Well, hello all, I'm Amanda Welch. I'm a recruiting consultant. If you have been on some of these things with Lincoln, you probably have seen me before. I just look a little different in um, that picture. Of course, I have much longer hair and haven't been um, back into the office in a couple of years. Um, my location formally is out of Fort Wayne. I will remain a work from home employee. Um, I actually live south of Fort Wayne in the Muncie area. Um, I started with Lincoln in October of 2015, so this will be seven years for me, um, specifically having a Bachelor of Science degree in journalism, so not in HR and not necessarily specifically in financial services. Um, that is often how that works here um, from Ball State University. Um, some things that I love the most, um, uh, again, I, I personally also, as Marcella does, I think I have the best job in the world. Um, and that is, you know, the opportunity to be able to connect the right people to the right opportunity at the right time um, and bring wonderful people on board. I had the pleasure of hiring Brian um, into his program. Um, and again, I had an opportunity to meet him about 18 months before I actually hired him. So it was an amazing experience. And um, like I said, it's always fun for me to be able to find those connections in what I do. Um, in terms of what I love the most about Lincoln, um, the work-life balance, you know, that definitely helps as someone who is, um, you know, many years, um, two moons past my, my college career, but, um, you know, I'm able to have that work-life balance for my family, still be able to, you know, do great work, um, work from home, be able to uh, take care of those that you can see on the screen to your right. Um, those are my three kiddos. Um, but what makes it, you know, really fulfilling is, is the people. Um, we have the best people around. Um, so I couldn't ask for better teams, better managers, you know, better leaders that I get to engage with, but also personally, you know, for me and my development. So um, that's a little bit about me. Passing that back to Brian. Cool. Thank you, Amanda. Um, now, this portion of the presentation will be our financial literacy workshop. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to enter it in the chat. Um, and then at the end of this segment, we'll have a quick uh, Q&A if anyone had any questions about it, and then we'll transition it to the recruiting piece. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to uh, Marcel. Thank you, Brian. So what exactly is financial literacy? So when we look at what is financial literacy, we're looking at being, financial pre being prepared financially, understanding debt, budgeting for your future and saving for your future. Being financial prepared means spending within your means, paying down your debt, protecting yourself, being prepared for the unexpected, getting and using the right information to make good financial decisions and having a plan for the future. I know all of you are really young and you know, you're still in school, but this is actually the best time to start thinking about uh, being financially prepared and being financially responsible. We are gonna look at understanding debt. When we look at our money, I mean, we have a lot of competing priorities. And as you get older, unfortunately, you, you get more priorities that you have to compete for. So, you know, you, you're going to be graduating from school soon. So you may have some student loans. Um, you may have some credit card debt. You may have a car payment. You might be thinking, okay, I'm going to have a job. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have to buy, you know, get a home. Um, you have family obligations. You may have child care. So our money is competing all over the place. So we want to start, you know, thinking about how our money is actually competing with our priorities. So where does your money exactly go? So you have your debt obligations and that's gonna be you know, your mortgage or your rent, uh, all your utilities, all that good stuff. Then you have credit card debt and car loans and student loans. So that's gonna make up your debt obligation. And then uh, savings, you know, we wanna look at 
where we're going to put our money because we want to put money towards maybe vacation or travel. We want to build an emergency fund. Uh, once you you know you have a home, you're going to start start thinking about saving money for some home improvements. Maybe you're looking down to buying a, a car in the future. Uh, healthcare expenses. I know you're you're all really young, but you know most people when they retired um, are going to have expenses in the healthcare that are going to be um, tremendous um, that we need to account for. And then, you know, we want to think about paying our college uh, or saving for college, you know, for our kids like down the road and maybe buying a home. All that is not created equal. I mean, we know that there's some bad debt out there. So getting into credit cards uh, debt or store credit cards or even auto loans are considered bad debt. I mean, if you buy a car, as soon as it leaves the lot, it loses value. Uh, but there are some good things that are considered good debt. I mean, if you yes, you're still in loans, hopefully that's gonna help you to get a better job and help you progress in your career. Uh, real estate mortgages and business loans are considered to be good, good debt. Before, you know, you, um, the pitfalls of credit card, you know, some of the things is that with credit card debt, it encourages you to spend more than you can afford. Cost most money, cost, it costs you more because you're paying interest. It borrows from your future income, can keep you from your financial goals and can lead to stress. Before incurring more debt, consider the long-term consequences of borrowing money or racking up more credit card. Recognize the difference between needs and wants. I mean, we all have needs and we all have wants. You know, maybe coffee is a need that we, you know, you have to have coffee every single day. That might be a need. But going to Starbucks every single day, that might be a want. Let's talk about budgeting for your future. Let's start with a budget. Plan your financial roadmap, save for retirement and other long-term goals and minimize your debt. When building a budget, we wanna start with uh, setting your goals. We're gonna add up your income, track your expenses, find the money, and then put the plan to work into action. And we'll look into each one of them separately. Setting your goals. What do I want and how do I want to make it happen? So let's break this down into two different types of goals. We want to look at short-term goals and we also want to look at long-term goals. So your short-term goals, maybe you're looking to go on a vacation, you know, um, and you're going to need to save for that or uh, maybe some of your short-term goals could be your entertainment goals or even Christmas goals, you know? So, I mean, Christmas is several months away, but that might be something that we start, we start, we need to start thinking of budgeting for that. Our long-term goals are gonna look more like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking to buy a home in five years. I wanna save for retirement. I wanna pay off my student loans. I wanna, you know, save money for my children's education. In general, people who set goals, uh, first of all, they feel more confident and they tend to accomplish them. But if you start saving for retirement, you tend to uh, set goals to increase a little bit every year. And when you do get to retirement, you're more likely 7.5 times more likely to feel confident that you will be able to retire. And the same thing with debt repayment. If you set the goals to repay your debt, um, First of all, you're gonna accomplish that because you're, you're putting something in action, but you're also gonna feel more confident, 3.5% more likely that um, you're gonna be ready as well for retirement. You wanna add up your income. So how much do you have? So you're looking at salary, bonuses, dividends, interest, spousal, child support, and any other income. For example, my son, uh, he's a college student and he works as an RA and he he gets you know some money from the school um, by doing some some job there 
but he's also in the National Guard. So he gets money from the National Guard. And from time to time, he does like a uh, DoorDash. So those would be his three different sources of income. So think about what sources of income you have to add up your income. Track your expenses. You wanna look at all your expenses, your household expenses. So you're looking at rent, utilities, cell phone. Uh, you wanna look at your insurance for your home and your car, transportation, healthcare, if you have to make any co-payments or if you're looking to have a membership in the gym or anything like that, your food and entertainment. Where can you find money to save? I mean, some of the things, you know, forego on the splurges, like we talked about, you know, Starbucks, maybe you could go, you know, maybe once a week instead of every single day to so try to cut down on that. Um, if you have several credit cards and your credit score is good, you could always reach out to the credit cards and ask them without, if they're not gonna run your credit report, if they're able to lower your interest. And sometimes just by asking, they could lower your interest. Um, the same thing, curbing your entertainment expenses. I know, you know, we all want to go out, hang out with your friends, uh, but maybe you could try to walk, find ways that, of doing things that are less expensive or for free. I always look for things in my city. I live in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and I'm always looking to see what can I do for free this weekend. And there's always something like, you know, there's hikes that people get together, there's garden, there's just different things that you could go and do for free. Um, you could also try to skip on some of the electronic upgrades. I know, you know, younger people always want to have the latest and best technology because, I mean, I have a son who's 20 years old. He's like, mom, I need an Apple, whatever. I don't know what the latest one is, like 11 or 12. I have like, mine is like a six. And I still gonna keep my six until like, it doesn't work anymore because it still works. And I don't need to have the upgrade, but I know younger people are like, I need to have it, I need to have it. But if you could, you know, make your um, telephones last a little bit longer, um, you know, you're saving money right there. And then um, if you need, you, know, you might need to boost your income, um, maybe have a little you know, extra part-time or, you know, like my son does the door dash. Um, so that's the way that he boosts his income whenever he needs money. He's like, okay, I need to work a few hours because I have no money. So, you know, and then you can always shop for bargains. Um, we talked about Christmas earlier. I always try to do my Christmas shopping early. Um, I mean, if I see something right now that I'm like, oh, this person, this would be a great Christmas gift. Um, I buy it right now. So then I don't have to think about Christmas expenses during Christmas time um, and try to, budget throughout the year instead of just having everything being bombarded in one month. So when you look at your budget, you want to look at, break it down into basically 50% of your budget, it's going to be towards your necessities. And that's going to be, you know, paying rent or your mortgage, all your utilities, your um, transportation, insurance, that's going to be your necessities. 30% um, are going to be wants. So it's not like you, you can't have your wants. You know, you still have 30% of your money that you could budget towards your, your wants. And you want 20% of your money to be geared towards your financial goals. Um, when you start working, a lot of jobs are going to have something like a 401k as a benefit. And um, I mean, ideally, you want to try to save between 10 to 15 percent towards retirement. But if that seems to be too much, start at least with the match with, with what the company is willing to give you. Um, for example, like Lincoln, our match is 100 percent. If you contribute dollar for dollar up to 6 percent, they will match 100 percent. And then once a year, um, we get an additional 4%. So basically the company is willing to give us 10% towards our retirement goals. Um, but when you're setting your budget, you know, be realistic. Like don't say, for example, I'm never gonna eat out. I'm gonna save all the money. So I'm just gonna cook every single night. Cause you know, that's not realistic. I know it's not realistic for me. So I'm sure it's not realistic for, for all of you. Um, but you know, if you, for example, go out, let's say eight times a month, 
you could say, you know what, I'm just going to cut down at maybe to go down five times a month instead of eight. And then you're saving three times uh, going out. So if you have a meal that maybe costs you like 15 to $20, right there, you found $60 a month that you could save towards your financial goals. And that could also be like, make sure you're setting up some kind of emergency fund. Um, you know, consider emergencies. I mean, emergencies come up, you know, when, when you think everything is, is dandy, it's like, oh, now I need new tires or I need this or I need to fix that or whatever. Um, so start, you know, creating your emergency budget and then uh, make sure you also track your, your budget. We want to make sure you're saving for your future. And the earlier you start saving, the better off you're going to be. This is an example, like if you're saving towards retirement, and this is if someone who's contributing uh, $200 a month and the rate of interest is about 6%. Notice the difference between someone who's 25 years old compared to someone who's 26. That year of delaying for uh, saving for retirement is costing $24,000. So if you could start early, you know, as soon as you're able to start with your job, you know, try to start saving uh, towards the future. And even, you know, I mean, one of the things that, you know, because you are young, you may want to try to save more upfront because you don't have that many responsibilities right now. So maybe you could aim for saving 10 to 15 percent of your salary up front. So when you do have kids or you have other responsibilities, if you need to lower it down, you can lower it down to maybe a 6%. Does anybody have any questions? I have one. Yes. Um, with the budgets, do you have any tools or anything you'd recommend for someone who had their paychecks fluctuate because they're on hourly pay still? Um, I mean, there's different budgets available, like different tabs. I mean, you could, I mean, you probably have some expenses that you know are, are set, right? So those are the ones that you basically need to plan for. And then the ones um, when you do have, you know, maybe extra money that you're like, oh, I got a little bonus then try to break it down and say, let me shift and put, you know, $20 or $25 towards saving and $25 towards something else. Um, I mean, that's the way I would do it. Just try to figure out exactly which ones are your definitely expenses that you, you're going to have. Thank you. I think Meg, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. I also just to, to comment on that I used to do percent of my money went into savings like I, I would take my tips at the end of the night and 10% of my tips went into my savings and it was like my travel fund and sometimes that was a dollar and sometimes that was five dollars <laughs> that was a lot more or a lot little or I think one time I put 25 cents in there and it was just like <laughs> Just a little bit of my cash, extra cash, went into that. And when I was hourly, that helped me, like, percentage versus amount for savings. Because, yeah, you have some fixed costs. That um, I was wondering, I don't know if this is totally relevant, but I, I saw these numbers for, like, starting salary and retirements. And it got me, or sorry, for retirement age. It got me wondering if all three of you have seen any data about um, starting salary and how that could make a difference for you for these for these people who are about to be graduates so like let's imagine somebody right out of college makes 45 or they negotiate to make 47 or they have relevant work experience so they can make 49 or something have you seen any data or studies about how that can really make a difference over a career? As far as saving towards like what you would have for retirement? Yeah, it could be. I mean, especially if, you're, if your employer doesn't match, then it would just be that much higher, right? 
but I was just curious since we're talking about budgeting and a lot of these people are seniors, if you've, if you've seen any studies about negotiate, how much, how if you negotiate a starting salary could be a little bit higher, how that could make a difference in the long run. Like it's 1,000 more dollars, but 1,000 more dollars over 25 years, what does that do for savings? I mean, there's a lot of calculators out there that you could plug in, um, you know, like, let's say you're starting at yeah, like 47 and you, a lot of jobs give you some kind of raise over time. So the calculators do take into account that you're going to make maybe a 2% increase over time. Mm. And so, but like to your point, going back to percentages, that's why it's, it's important to try to save in percentages. Mm -hmm. Because if your salary does fluctuate that, you know, year you're making more money than the, the previous year, then it's going to take into account a little bit more than the previous year. Mm -hmm. right. But that might be a question that Amanda could address later, uh, because she's more in human, she's in human resources. Um, so maybe Amanda could address that one. Okay, thanks. We do have a question on the chat, and then we'll move on to the recruiting piece, and then we'll still have a Q&A afterwards. So if you still have more questions, we'll, 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 we'll try to address them at the end. Um, but one more question here on the chat, it says, my goal is to invest in dividend stocks and build a separate source of income. Since I don't have many expenses currently, should I just invest as much as I can? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pass it over to Marcella for that one. So, I mean, we don't give um, a specific advice on what to do with your with your money. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you could build an account, you know, and, and save as much as you can, whether you're investing or you're, you're that maybe buying property down the road or doing different things, um, all those venues are going to help you down the road. Perfect. Um, I'll go ahead and we'll transition it over to Amanda. Like I said, if you have more questions, feel free to still put them in the chat. Uh, we'll definitely, after Amanda's piece, we'll do a Q&A and answer any, any questions that come up. Good questions. All right, so diving in here to opportunities at Lincoln. Um, this here is just a, you know, a little bit of information about someone that has joined us shortly after graduation. Um, we'll pop into that next area here um, to further talk about some of our opportunities. So with that, we have multiple business areas. So a lot of people, um, and I mentioned, of course, at the very beginning that I'm a journalism major. So I have a totally different background than not only what I do, but what we do at Lincoln as an organization in insurance and financial services. Um, so some business areas that we work through are actuarial, so actuarial, actuarial science, finance, operations, um, which I work heavily in. I know Brian works in operations regularly, um, our risk management area, human resources. So actually my actual job, um, marketing and communications, customer service, legal and compliance, information technology and our digital initiatives, as well as our sales and relationship management team. Um, and again, typically someone will fit into one of these packets across all of Lincoln. So those are some of our major, major business areas. Um, with that, um, before graduation, right? So things that we have, you know, prior to graduation, opportunities that we have for those of you still in school, um, that would be, of course, our actuarial internship development program. So for those you know, anybody that is going through that actuarial program that is very interested in actuary, um, this will be very specific towards, you know, product development, pricing, visualization, financial reporting, asset and liability management, and those kind of sectors of truly actuary science. Um, there's also our internship development program. Our internship development program in both of these are typically summer-based programs. This one specifically nine-week summer program. It's been virtual since 2020, um, where we would work with executive leadership to gain exposure, 
through our summer speaker series. There is a for formal mentorship program over the course of those nine weeks. So not only do you have your, your leader for your day job of your internship, but then you'll also have a um, member of my team, um, not recruiting specifically, but someone in the HR space that's going to serve as a mentor. Um, a lot of career development workshops and resources. So again, all of these are kind of built into the day-to-day -day of the job. So you have the day-to-day -day work, whether you find that in marketing or customer service or um, you know finance, accounting, whatever that may be, um, we're going to also have a lot of these development pieces, the speaker series, the mentor. All of our internships are going to be project-driven. Um, and that's important because we want to make sure that as you are gaining some experience, that you actually have experience that you can put on your resume. So this is the project. This is what I worked on. This is how it was being used so that you actually have some experience that you can speak to versus, um, you know, I, I did a lot of errands <laughs> for people. You know, that's not the ultimate goal. We want to make sure that you have something under your belt where you can say, I did this, I accomplished this, this is how it was being used. In addition, another piece to that is, you know, we, we want to create really truly a meaningful experience um, where again, you can dive in a little bit deeper and say, okay, I have a better understanding of what I was doing and, um, you know, what I would be doing kind of more so in the real world, right? So post-graduation. Um, virtual engagement events for all participants. So of course our internship program this summer is also virtual once again. So still making sure that we can still engage with each other, that we can connect with each other, um, that you can really you know, build relationships with your peers within the program and not just you know, with the people that you work with in, in your day-to-day, -day, like I said, box. And then we also have National Intern, Intern Day recognition and a celebration that we have from that perspective. Um, so post-graduation, so for those of you that are right around the corner from graduation, we have a couple of sectors as well, of course, looking at the actuarial development program. So this is post-graduation and a development program that's going to give you opportunities to continue to study for your actuarial exams, be able to work in a rotation, in multiple rotations. Um, typically that is going to have a rotation every 18 to 24 months. So it is a little bit of a longer program than say Brian's program being part of the Lincoln or leadership preparation program. Um, but again, still giving you an opportunity to continue to build uh, your experience and background in the actuary sciences. With the Lincoln preparation program, um, this is that two year accelerated career development program. So essentially, instead of coming in and to the entry level, which most do, so I'll be very honest, most do, um, but you would be able to come into a little bit of an accelerated development program. It's two years. That doesn't mean that your job with Lincoln ends in two years, it just means that the programmatic pieces of the role ends in two years. As part of the program, you will have, just as you did in the internship, your day job. So you'll have your kind of day-to-day -day duties. Hey, there's brand scat. Um, so you'll have your day-to-day -day duties, but then you will also have a lot of development. So you're going to get kind of that development, mentoring still, the program leadership, in-person and, and virtual social events, depending on location, team building activities, annual LPP day of service, so those are all built into your day-to-day. -day. I know that we also have projects that are built in that are specific to the program. So there are your projects in your day job. So it's still gonna be very project oriented like your internship program. Um, but then there will also be projects through the program where you'll actually get to work with other LPPs because not every area has multiple LPPs. Um, so they don't necessarily have multiple folks that are it, part of that preparation program. Um, so it's giving you an opportunity, again, to work very closely with your peers, truly from a program perspective, but then also um, be able to work, again, across your business unit. So it's a two-year program. Like I said, it's like an extended internship um, that lasts a little bit longer and just really gives you a lot of high-level exposure um, in the organization that you may not otherwise 
receive for some some period of time. So it's not to say that it you can't um, get that exposure coming in in again that next piece that entry level direct hire piece. It's just something that um, you'll develop too. Um, so that's what that will look like. So we do have entry level direct hire roles. So post graduation, you say yes, I'd like to look at some opportunities. Um, we have a tremendous amount of opportunities across all of Lincoln in all of our business units. So not only, you know, those various kind of eight areas that we walked through previously, but across our four major product lines, um, as well as a few outliers that sit in between that as well. So it definitely gives you a lot of opportunities to come in one way or another um, with Lincoln and really be able to to grow, to develop. Um, we have development conversations regularly. You know, as you grow, you will be able to take on projects, um, you know, gain understanding, grow up and through in the areas that you join, and then of course, take on additional opportunities to Lincoln. So lots of different ways to get where you wanna go from a career perspective um, post-graduation. So we definitely have some of those opportunities. From there, um, taking a look at, you know, what happens from here. Um, Brian, if you could pop me to the next slide here. Oh, that would be great. Um, you know, some things that I know that we wanted to talk about, and this is, will be, like I said, we'll pop in and, and start talking about some questions. So I know one area that we really wanted to talk about is kind of preparing for, right, jobs, um, preparing for jobs, preparing for those interviews, um, and, and what does that look like, right? Um, of course, that is part of our process. And even if we look here, um, keeping the conversation going, there's that QR code that you saw at the beginning. Um, and that also has to do with the link. So again, I'm gonna put that link back in the chat function, especially if you are joining through your phone today. Um, essentially, you can use your phone, your camera, which will connect you to that link that I do have in the chat. And this is where we will be able to continue to keep the conversation going after today. Um, essentially, I am a recruiter with Lincoln. So part of my role is having conversations about various roles that we have um, in the organization. So a lot of the first step you would experience at Lincoln is kind of an initial phone conversation, getting to know you what you're hoping to do, what's important to you in a role, you know, kind of level setting what your compensation expectations are, the, um, the role that you've applied to and what that looks like. So I would say one of the most important things um, in that initial conversation, especially if you have a screening conversation before you have an official interview, I would say is be you. Um, I don't need you to, you know, be so overly prepared that I have no idea who you are <laughs> and what's important to you and what that looks like. Um, I would say in any interview process, as you're looking at roles, the number one most important thing is being yourself. Um, most people don't really think of they're like, okay, I want to be prepared. I want to, I want to, what, what do I need at the end of the day? Um, you will always, always, always shine if you're you, um, right? So I don't want a lot of canned answers. There's no right or wrong answers to a lot of the questions that interviewers ask. Um, that's the God's honest truth. There's no wrong answer. It just gives me an idea to learn more about you. And if it's the wrong answer, maybe the role is wrong. It's not a you thing. <laughs> it's not a you thing. It's the, the role might not be the right role. Um, when we go into formal interviewing, so things to think about, um, be prepared with questions. Um, you know, even if you haven't, maybe you have talked to a recruiter, is there anything else that you want to know? Um, I always tell people, write them down, bring it, bring a list. There is absolutely nothing wrong with bringing a notebook with you, jotting down questions, even as somebody is talking, um, and making sure that you can recap those. Some important questions to ask your um, your interviewer, you know, what do they enjoy about the company? What has their career path looked like? You know, what has been important to them? What did they enjoy about working for the organization? Because at the end of the day, yes, we are interviewing you and nobody loves that. Um, zero percent of people love the interview process. Zero percent. Um, I didn't love the interview process and I do this for a living. <laughs> so I didn't love it. Um, it was nerve wracking. I hadn't, I hadn't interviewed for a job in nine years. 
um, before I came to Lincoln almost seven years ago. So if that tells you anything, um, definitely nobody's favorite thing, right? They want to be impressive, but there is, um, you know, you just never know kind of what to expect. So um, I will say, be prepared to ask questions, um, but the interview process, yes, they're gonna ask you a lot of questions and sometimes maybe very behavioral based, sometimes maybe very, um, you know, just focusing in on what you have done, that transferable skills. So how they, you can kind of take one thing and bring it into another, um, which is how I ended up in financial services because again, journalism background, um, <laughs> journalism background. So um, not always looking for someone to fit directly into a box. Um, but what I can say is the interview process is just as much for you an opportunity to say, is this role the right role for me? Is this team the right team for me? Um, is the leadership style a way that I would respond well? Um, those are all things that are going to be important for you, um, for you to decide, do, you, do I like them as much as they like me and vice versa? So don't forget the interview process is the two-way street. It's not just you. Um, it's not just you. Um, and interview processes, they can be very long. They can be very short. So um, a good question to ask is what does the process look like so that you can, um, can gauge what that might look like. I know in some cases it's you know one, to one stop. Sometimes it's one to two. I've seen businesses go to three after that, come on. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how I feel about four or five steps of an interview to, because that, what else can somebody find out about, you, right? Um, I know I had two. Um, so I had my initial phone conversation and then I had, um, actually, no, I had my initial phone conversation and then I had my, um, no. No, nope. initial phone conversation. And then I had two interviews with that. So one with who became my leader um, initially. And then the third was with a couple of members of my team and a couple of the leaders I would be supporting. So, and even then, like I said, that was all nerve wracking because they were all, you know, AVPs and VPs and all of the things that go along with that. So um, trust me, you won't always necessarily see that, but you may see definitely a couple of steps. Um, as they work through the interview process, there is absolutely nothing wrong. I still recommend it to this day. I'm certain that, you know, Career Services Meg would probably say this as well. Um, when you reach out and um, you know, post the interview, reach out, provide a thank you, send that email. Um, e even if it's an email, it doesn't have to necessarily be the written because so much of us are home now. Um, especially if you're interviewing in, in, in a virtual environment like this one, um, I would say send the email, thank them for their time. You would be surprised. I get that about 5% of the time. So it does not mean that I don't hire the people who don't, but it sticks out for the people who do. Um, it makes me remember them. And I've had particularly those for the internship program and our LPP program, I've had those managers that said, hey, you know, like we have, I would say four good candidates that we're going to pass into the second round. And that's where we're going to kind of narrow that down to our top one. But two did respond, two did not. Doesn't mean we're going to stop them through the process. But those two really stuck out because they, they thanked us and they reiterated what was said in the interview and kind of connected the two of them together. It made a difference. Um, so again, it doesn't mean that it's ultimately what that looks like, but it is something that sticks out. It makes it memorable after the interview. Um, there's also nothing wrong with, you know, working through with like an HR partner with me, um, you know, as you're progressing through to follow up, to follow through. And during the interview process, there isn't necessary, there anymore, it's not a bad thing to talk about compensation. Now, I wouldn't ask it right out of the gate, right? Um, so, but before you get to that offer stage, you know, there is nothing wrong with inquiring what a range looks like um, so that you're prepared, right? So you're prepared for what that looks like, but then it will make it easier when it comes time to discuss offers. Say you are that person that's ultimately selected um, to be able to start having conversations and negotiating. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with negotiating. If they're going to extend you an offer and you ask 
for a counter offer, that doesn't mean that the offer goes away. Um, essentially, whether they come back with a yes or no, it just puts that back in your in your corner to decide what are you going to do. So I know it feels very bold <laughs> to counter and to ask questions. I will say be judicious with that though. Um, you will find a lot of research out there that will talk about what somebody with this degree has or what this degree has. I would definitely say maybe head more towards your glass doors um, because that's going to give some feedback based on people who actually work at the organization. So not just the ranges, because you will be able to get that information. But a lot of the information that comes in on Glassdoor and those types of resources, it will tell you what somebody has self-disclosed in the role. So it'll give a more honest range where, you know, a general you know, range may be based on a completely different city in a completely different area, completely different location, um, which may not align because again, a, a compensation in California is going to be very different than here in the Midwest um, and in other parts of the United States. So somebody that's in, you know, the Northeast and Philadelphia or whatnot, it, their cost of living is going to be significantly higher than it is here. Um, so again, those are all factors to look at just to have an idea, but don't be uh, swayed, I guess, sometimes when you see, um, oh, MBA can capture, you know, $90,000 a year. Yeah, let's, it's not to say that it can't. Um, it's not to say that it cannot, but usually not on the MBA itself. So that is just something to be aware of there. Um, wow, that is a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> so there is a whole, whole bunch about, you know, some general interviewing, some follow ups negotiating salaries. Um, this is your time. What questions can I answer for you guys? And again, if there's anything that you wanna put on the chat, we're monitoring that as well. And this could be questions in regards to interviewing, recruiting. Um, I know that we have seniors um, in this virtual room. So good opportunity to kind of what to do as you're preparing for graduation. If you have any questions about of the financial literacy portion, you can also ask that. Um, if you want to have any questions on, uh, I was a student not that long ago, so I can also give you guys some advice on what, how I went through it, and now being in the, the big world, if you will, or corporate world and stuff like that. So yeah, any questions that you guys have, um, this is your time, the last 10 minutes, so we'll open it up. I have a question. So after college, like I want to pursue like a law degree. So do you guys like have any internships that would like align with that? We do. I don't know that we do at this time because our internships are summer based. So those will start um, for us in June. I would say anytime that you're looking, if you're very specifically looking at Lincoln, you can always go to our job board, jobs.lincolnfinancial.com. The link that's actually in um, the chat and of course, part of that QR code that we had provided that actually allows you to not only create a, kind of a mini profile in the system, which makes you, cause I'm able to meet you, right? I'm able to see you. Um, but then it allows the other recruiters on my team. There are about 15 of us to be able to see your information as well. So we can actually go into the system and you can kind of put in there what interests you, what that looks like. Um, I would say anytime you're in school, we do have internships. We do have legal and compliance. Um, it's a huge foundation for our company because we're so heavily regulated across the various states and also federally. So there's a lot of different components to the legal aspect of what we do. And then of course there's different kinds of legal. So I deal with employment law. Um, in my world and our employment lawyers and things of that nature, which is a different sector than say um, legal and compliance for one of our product lines. So there is definitely a lot of that opportunity as you want to pursue those kind of opportunities. As long as you're in school, uh, internships are available. It looks like there was a question on the chat. Um, if you can give one piece of advice when it comes to negotiating job offers, and understanding your value, what would it be? And this could be for both Amanda and Marcella, any piece of advice for our students? Um, I mean, I would say, you know, like 
sometimes the money is not everything because you also want to see like the culture of the company and you also want to see what opportunities are there for um, advancements or maybe changing jobs or doing something different. Um, so sometimes, you know, you know, it might just take like to take a step. I, I would say you may have to take a step back to take a step forward mm -hmm. in regards to money. From time to time. Yeah. So there is, there's nothing wrong. I would say when you're negotiating a job offer and kind of knowing and understanding your value, that's kind of where some of that research comes in. And I would say definitely looking at those job boards, like your, um, oh, like your glass door to get just an idea of what a range would be for someone in that role. Now it doesn't always tell you what experience they have. Um, but again, there's nothing wrong, particularly if you have like an, an initial conversation with a recruiter like me before you go in directly with a hiring manager, a hiring manager, there's nothing wrong to ask about the range. You know, what can I expect? What is, you know, anticipated com com ugh, compensation? Just so when you're looking at the role, you know, kind of a jumping off point, you know what's expected. Um, or what's going to be anticipated and but what Marcella said is correct I would say you don't want to sh look at that so high that for example a, a company won't look at you but at the same time yes you do need to know your value to an extent um, so I would say do a little bit of research be armed with that information Again, the first offer doesn't have to be the last offer. They will typically tell you, like in my world, I, I will disclose. I will let you know what that is, what that range is, where that role sits. If you tell me that you want 65 and I know that my role pays around 60 and I don't have a lot of wiggle room, I'm going to tell you that. Um, and I'm going to ask, is that something that you would be willing to consider? Because if that answer is no, then it's not a good fit for you. It's not a good fit for us. Doesn't mean that we don't have other roles that would be, but then it's not a good fit. So that's part of, you know, again, that process of exploring and asking questions. Um, it does make people feel uncomfortable to ask questions about money. We've been programmed for years not to talk about it. Um, I didn't talk about it growing up with my family. Like we didn't talk about that. We still don't. 